Hey everyone, welcome back to part two of my video series with Scott Rinkenberger. If you missed the first video, make sure to go back and watch that. We'll link in the description below. In this video, we dive deep into Scott's photography, his creative process, and his mantra, sharing art through adventure, what that really means to him. You mentioned one time, I don't know if, uh, I'm, I'm gonna paraphrase, but uh, you mentioned one time in one of your your chats that uh, someone asked you about uh, taking selfies. Yeah. Do you remember your response? I, get, I, I don't remember how I, how I phrased it exactly, but it was essentially that if the most fascinating or compelling thing at any given moment on planet Earth is my own face, then I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's, yeah. That's about it. Yeah. 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 The, you had those memories of first time snapping in the boots and yeah. wiggling around in the ski. Do you have the early memories of from behind the camera to seeing something get produced that works and get seen? The photography came in a lot more of a sort of slow building organic fashion. Um, whereas when I was six years old, I knew I wanted to be a skier. Um, it took me until I was well into my adult life before I fully understood the extent to which I wanted to be a professional photographer. Um, and that was more a reflection of sort of continuing to hold on to the skiing than anything else. It wasn't until I had worked with a number of photographers and sort of understood the work that they were creating of me skiing and you know how they were doing it and then how they were building careers around that and and all of that before I started to sort of develop a vision for myself of sort of how that might might, might look and feel um, and then even then I you know I sort of dipped toes in by assisting for other photographers and then took on a, uh, a long-term role for another photographer as a full-time assistant and editor and all that. Um, and it wasn't until really late in that sort of period that I was like, okay, I'm going to actually do this for myself and create my, my own photography career. Um, and so there wasn't like, and, and by that time I had a lot of experience in the industry and I, and I sort of, seen behind the curtain and I, I knew how the whole game was played. And so once I sort of set out on my own and, you know, had images published pretty, you know, I found success really quickly in my own career after um, leaving my sort of apprenticeship um, because I already sort of understood all of the nuts and bolts of, of how the game is played. Um, and so there wasn't like an aha moment, like, ah, I got a magazine you know, a photo published in a magazine, this is how it works. Um, in a way, like when I got my first photo published as a skier in a magazine, it was like, I can do this. I can, you know, like, let's see what we can build off of this. And by the time I sort of had the equivalent moment in photography, um, I already had 15 years of understanding sort of ski photography as both an athlete and an assistant to another photographer and you know, and so it wasn't like a light bulb moment. It was like a long trajectory toward building, you know, building a body of work and a brand and a business. What would you say to those young guys, young ladies that are, you know, like, oh, I can just do this myself, you know, and all yeah. that. What would you yeah. say to those those young young people that are, are trying I, to be creative and find their own way? Yeah, uh, I'd say more power to you. Like, I think my my advice is sort of figure out wherever you can jam a foot in, and if you feel like you know you've you've got something to say and you've got the means by which to say it, and all you need is some you know some YouTube videos to kind of get you over the hump of gaining some requisite knowledge, go for it. Like most photographers are coming out of the woodwork organically and building building their own vision from the ground up. On the other hand, if, if you do find the opportunity to, to work under someone who's been doing it for a long time and who has a lot of experience and is a great teacher and is open to sharing what they've learned, I, you know, I, I would recommend that over a formal education every single time. 
when we're talking about art through adventure, yeah, what does that mean to you? That basically means that the the adventure, whether it's you know a backcountry ski mission or an alpine climbing mission or a mountain bike trip or whatever, um, the adventure becomes a mechanism for me to get to see and experience places in a in a deep and meaningful way, and in a way that I wouldn't have access to if it, if I didn't sort of cross this threshold into adventuring because it's generally technical terrain in wilderness environments and sort of there's a there's an element of of adventure to how I um, how I operate in the mountains and where I like to to be and to work and so um, there's sort of a really classical um, you know adventure photography genre where the environment exists but the human is the hero and, you know, sort of the, um, yeah, the human centric view of, of the environment or else there's sort of classical uh, landscape photography, which tends to lean toward not being particularly adventurous and, you know, closer to cars and trailheads and viewpoints and that, you know, and, um, and so you see a lot of repetition of subject matter um, just because you're, you're, you know, traditional landscape photographers tend to, operate in, in fairly close radius to, to conveniences and your adventure photographers tend to celebrate the adventure above all else. Um, and I try and sort of find a sweet middle between the two where the adventure is, is an imperative component to the creation of the work, but, but artistry is, is sort of the end goal. When you're, when you're framing those shots, what are you telling yourself? What do you... To, to those that are like, how does, how do we do this? How, yeah. How do I, sh how do I, how do I take photos? You know, yeah. just be, what are you telling yourself as you're, as you're approaching some of those, those beauties? Fundamental to, to the craft of photography is like learning to see or learning to see in a way that then can be captured photographically. Um, and so there's, there's a filter already running in my mind like okay here's how this could be captured and here's what it'll look like in black and white and here's the component elements that I'm trying to expose for and so there's a mental image before there's a physical manifestation of that mental image and then once I kind of have a like if I'm inspired by a scene and I've sort of like understood what it is about it that I'm trying to capture um, then I sort of turn on the the part of my brain that I learned through commercial photography, which is shoot a lot of images and f do a lot of framings and a lot of compositions and a lot of focal lengths and like really hammer away at a subject um, if you have the time and the luxury to do so, so that you don't come back to the lab and look at it and say, oh, I wish I shot it vertically. Like it would be a really cool shot if it's vertical, but horizontally it's cropped wrong and it looks weird. It does not balanced, or you know, it doesn't doesn't have the je ne sais quoi that I had in my mind's eye. Um, and so, it's sort of a process of of pre visualization and then volume capture, and then hopefully in the back end, like distilling it down to the the thing that most closely matches the aesthetic in my mind. One of the components that sets um, really good photography apart from average photography is is that average photography sort of records a scene um, in a relatively benign but literal fashion. And great photography finds an element in the broader scene, in the broader world. You know, if you take sort of, let's take street photography, for instance. Um, you can, you know, walk into downtown Manhattan and take a picture of, of the street as it exists and it'll have people in it and it'll have taxis and it'll have buildings in it and it'll have sort of all of the components that make up great street photography. But if you look at the work of a great street photographer, they will have found one person's set of strangely glancing eyes or, or the exact right piece of litter that's composed in the perfect way that um, tr is a microcosm of this vast, hard to understand environment that teleports a person like deeply into the feeling of being in that place or being in that experience. Um, and so uh, with, my, with my outdoor photography, I try and find th those, those same elements, those sort of smaller,
pieces within the grander landscape that um, give you a little bit more insight and a closer look into, into how, how it feels to be in those places. What do you say to those folks that, not so much that they're afraid to get out, but just aren't exploring enough? What, you yeah. got a message for those people? I think people should feel comfortable approaching what they want to do and then a little bit challenged by doing the thing, you know, and hopefully finding that point where like, yeah, this isn't like um, psychically overwhelming, but I'm having to like grow into this experience. Um, and what, you know, however that manifests itself seems great to me. I guess what, I, what I'm hoping to, to do and to inspire um, is, an, is a level of appreciation um, for the natural world. And then, you know, there's a huge component to what I do and why I do it and how I do it that's, you know, trying to create a more sustainable future on planet Earth for, you know, my kids and their kids and, and, and humanity on, you know, on the whole. Um, and, and I think that an, a deep understanding and appreciation of the natural world is a, is a really critical mechanism in making sure that we live in said world holistically and, and in a sustainable fashion. Um, and so, uh, you know, I hope to create tools that inspire people to look more closely at the natural world and then to understand it better and to explore it more robustly and to work harder to, to make sure that it remains um, healthy and wild and, and captivating and, and all the wonderful things it is. I'm curious when when someone comes up to you who's never heard of you yeah, and they see those galleries and stuff and they get the light in their eye, how does that, how does that make you feel? Yeah, I think it's fantastic. I think, I think one of the things that I'm trying to do um, is, is distill, you know, the sort of massive grandeur that exists in the wild. And so when someone connects deeply with my photography, uh, what I like to think is it's them actually connecting deeply with nature and using my photography as a vehicle by which to do so. And for me, the sort of highest end I can have is, is for people to appreciate and then want to more deeply experience and then protect and you know the, the natural environment um, and so if I can sort of be, be a conduit in that way I'm really happy and and so those interactions with people that are excited about my work uh, just make me feel like you know hopefully I'm moving their psyche in in a direction of appreciation for the natural world and I think that'll you know manifest itself positively down the road. When you're preparing those prints for the clients, yeah. you're kind of at that final moments of letting the thing, the babies go. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, how does, that, how does that make you feel when you're getting all that stuff prepared? Good, yeah. There's a reason, like, it's, I would say it's very non-standard um, for a sort of working professional photographer like myself to do one's own framing and printing. For me, while we've lost sort of the, um, a lot of the critical analog elements of photography, you know, with the sort of film mostly for professional purposes having gone by the wayside and, and developing your own prints having gone by the wayside, and, um, but there's still uh, the analog component of you can still create your own prints and you're doing it with digital printing technology and all that these days, but you're making an art print and then you can mat it and frame it and have a thing that you're holding in your hands and handing to someone and they're putting on a wall and that, you know, that has a real tangible life to it. Um, and that's the only, other than the creation of the photography, that's the only other opportunity you have to sort of get your hands dirty um, in the creation process. And so I'm, I, I really embrace that kind of um, that moment of, of taking it back into the analog space. It's like you, you, you capture it while living in the analog space and then you do everything on a computer and then to, to finish the circle and be able to, to make something um, tangible, I, I think for me is, is a really important point of closure and it's, and it's where I feel like the work is actually finished. There you have it. I hope you enjoyed part two of my sit down with Scott diving deep into his photography and creative process. There's still one more part to go where we sit down with Scott and hear about 
all the reasons he loves living in the Snoqualmie Valley, what it's like raising adventurous and creative kids, and more. I'm Brian Davis. I hope to see you in the valley.